annual Venture Prize pitch workshop. And um, it's, it's really exciting for us. We have more registrants today than we've ever had before. And I think that really reflects something um, that's happening in a macro scale. And that is that entrepreneurship is now being seen as a vital part of our lives. And it doesn't necessarily have to be all our lives. It doesn't necessarily have to even be a side hustle, but I think fluency around entrepreneurship benefits everybody. And so the more that uh, we understand, the better we'll be. But for your purposes today, you're really here to figure out how to take what you've worked so hard to develop and now show the value and the purpose of it to others who can support you. So without further ado, I would like to move on to the land acknowledgement. And um, so I, I, first of all, I wanna say something about land acknowledgements. They, they, they tend to be sometimes perfunctory. Um, I, I find I have to read them to be able to ensure that I honor the words correctly, but I'd also like you to take a moment just to think about where you are, whatever building you're in, whatever structure you're standing in right now or sitting in is built on land that was here long before any of us. And it's important to acknowledge that the, the keepers of the land were the Indigenous First Nations. Um, and so take a moment wherever you are in the province, in the country, to uh, recognize that, please. But we respectfully acknowledge the Musqueam, the Sl Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the, uh, <laughs> the Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Sawasan's peoples on whose territories our three campuses reside. Lynn, you may have accidentally muted yourself. You're back. Sorry about that. Our agenda for today is setting the scene. We want you to understand who you're going to be talking to. Um, we want you to understand what you're trying to achieve and what's important for your audience to hear. Um, the number one thing I think is really, really critical to understand is this is no longer about you. You are now transitioning to make your company or organization relevant to somebody else and understanding that somebody else is really important and um, will help you think about what to avoid. And then we'll talk about the re recipe for success, the pitch itself, which will be the compelling problem, the problem, the, the promising solution that you have to offer, having the right team and the authority to say so. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my partner in crime this afternoon, Michael Cheng, who is the CEO and founder of Lumen5. Michael, can you just share a few words? Yeah, sure. So this is a lot of fun for me. Um, I went through the Venture Prize competition. I don't know exactly how long. I, I'm, I'm inclined to think somewhere between eight and 10 years ago. Um, and as Lynn was mentioning earlier, you know, entrepreneurship is much more common these days, much more uh, popular these days being recognized as a real career path, as opposed to when I went through university, uh, it was difficult to spell the word. I guess it's still difficult to spell the word. Um, and so having some experience in the competition, having won the competition years back, I've uh, had the good fortune of building several companies since graduation, also winning several pitch competitions along the way at, at different um, citywide scales, uh, province-wide scales, and then nationwide scales. I'm happy to share a bit of what I've learned. And in my opinion, pitching is one of the most important skills you can have. Really what pitching is, is how do you tell a compelling story within a short period of time? And it doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter if you're a competition, what is a job? interview if not just you telling a compelling story in a short period of time. Storytelling is, a, is an essential skill and I'm excited to dive deeper into it with Lynn. Thanks Mike. So setting the scene. First of all, who you're talking to. You need to really understand that uh, typically you, if, I, hang on, let me pull this back even further. 
we're talking about venture pitch. This is this is what we're hoping to groom you and give you tools for. But the idea, ideally, everything that you take away with you today, you'll be able to apply in future pitches and just general discussion. So understand who you're talking to. For our purposes today, it is the venture prize judges. It's a panel of judges and look at them as investors because they will see themselves as potentially your investors. And that means do your homework. Yeah, I wanna add a couple of things there. So, you know, whenever telling us, whenever you're telling a story, I think it's important to put yourself into the shoes of the person who's listening. And in this context, it's gonna be a judge. So understanding what is the mindset of a judge? A judge is being brought into this competition. They're being asked to do a little bit of role playing. It is a uh, not a real investor pitch, but they're, they're, there's role playing on both sides. And that's what happens in competitions. So um, it's not just about understanding what a judge is looking for. It's about asking, it's about understanding what is the role that they're trying to play and what are they supposed to be looking for? And in this case, a venture competition is a panel of judges who are supposed to think like investors. And the key difference there is an investor is looking for some sort of impact, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a return on investment if it's a nonprofit investment, for example. They're looking for some sort of impact, uh, and an investor is giving you something. In, uh, in, in the business world, they're giving you an investment, which could be $10,000, it could be $10 million. In this context, it still holds true. They're deciding on who to award the prize to, which is a form of investments, both in um, potentially monetary, but also just in publicity. There is an investment that's being made and only one or top three is able to receive this investment. So that mentality is important to understand. This is a competition. You are competing with, um, with other companies or other cohort members. And so what doing your homework means is not necessarily just preparing your presentation and your pitch through your own lens, but through the lens of others. Who are you competing with? Um, for example, if you've done your homework and you found that there's um, there's multiple members within the panel of judges who have a background in what you do, great. Maybe that's an opportunity to go a bit deeper because you, you know they understand. Uh, if you have a panel of judges who come from very strong financial backgrounds, well, maybe that's a signal for you to spend a bit more time. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's important to recognize that all competitions, uh, no matter how, how clear the criteria or the rubric is, it's driven by the judges who are inherently human. And humans have different backgrounds, different preferences, uh, and it's worthwhile. Nowadays, it's easier than ever to do your homework. You can go on LinkedIn. You can look at, once you have the names of the people who are judging you, um, you can see where they've come from. And then from their experience, use that to influence the way in which you present the information um, to what level of depth in what areas you focus more on, or at the very least, anticipate what kind of questions this type of individual might ask you. So first challenge to you is when you're, for those of you who are doing, uh, participating in Venture Pitch, find out who your judges are and do a little research. What you're trying to achieve. Ultimately, you're influencing behavior and never underestimate that your role in doing that. You're, that's for the pitch, that's for your business, that's for your industry. You are looking to make an impact that is going to tell somebody, signal somebody that they once they have information, they need to take action. So always be action oriented. Always understand what your call to action is. In the venture pitch scenario, you got a really clear call to action. Fund me, let make me a winner. When you're in business, what's the call to action? So that's how are you going to stand out? You'll be able to use your values. You'll be able to use your um, product offering, your organization. That means understanding the landscape. That means understanding who else is in your space and why you're different to them. When you're looking to win, find out what nuggets and synthesize them down to really sim simple, clear, easy to, to, to absorb nuggets of information so that uh, someone voting for you really identifies with it. Now, personally, I've had a lot of success with finding values. Organizations who have a purpose um, often might have the same purpose as multiple other organizations. So why should anyone go trust them and back them, use them, turn to them? 
because often they have values that drove them to develop whatever they're offering, their bell widget or service might be. And very often that's where there's a story and that's where people connect. So your reason for coming up with your bell widget or service is really something that you need to weave into your marketing and do it in such a way that it's succinct, that it's identifiable, universal, and really purpose-driven. And that doesn't, doesn't diminish the, the commodity value, the, the price competition, all those things are also important, but you can build a story around that. Mike, did you have more thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I want to touch on the, one of the first points we talked about here. You know, influencing behavior really stands out to me in the context of a conversation or a competition like this. Is there is a difference between playing for fun and playing to win? And if you're, you know, we could go dribble on a basketball court, and that's playing for fun. But if we're playing to win, we're going to be much more deliberate about strategy, about passing, about about getting the ball into the hoop. Um, and when when I'm thinking about influencing behavior, is relating this to the earlier point. How can you influence the behavior of someone you don't understand? This the step one to influencing the behavior of someone is understanding how they think, how they act. And that's in the context of the decisions they've made in the past. And so this goes back to doing your homework too, is not only do you want to know the names of your judges, you want to know um, almost their psychological profile. Where the uh, Have they invested in startups before and why or why not? Um, part of the homework is also who are the previous winners of the venture prize competition? Why did they win? Are you able to talk to someone on the judging panel who was involved in previous years and understand uh, what were the things that helped them stand out and try and piece your way backwards? And that's the difference, I think, between focusing on your own business and your own pitch to actually playing to win in the context of a competition. Um, again, repeating the, the main message here is you cannot influence the behavior of someone you don't understand. So doing homework is to understand understand someone's behavior. And through that, you can start to influence them. Um, and that's the way in which you can start to win. And as Lynn was talking about, you know, once you understand someone, uh, it's not, obviously not about pitching them a business that they want to hear. It still goes back to your business and your idea and your venture. Um, it's how do you position your venture in the context of the person who's judging. Uh, and I think so many businesses our business ideas or, or full-blown full businesses are very complex. There's many different ways you can position a business and how you position it in the context of a competition does determine how well you can stand out um, and how likely you are to capture the attention of the judges. That's great. That's so true. Thank you. So let's drill into that. What's important to your audience? Well, the size of the market opportunity. Mike, why don't you go first this time? Sure. So one thing to keep in mind is, and that's one of the trickier things in a, in a university setting is um, more often than not. Now, obviously there's exceptions like Mark Zuckerberg, I believe in university, started building um, a trillion dollar business. Um, you know, it's common in the earlier stages that ideas are a bit smaller. So your first business idea, um, you know, it might be a lemonade stand or a neighborhood paint shop. And so it's important to recognize from a judge's perspective, if you view them as investors, they're looking for a massive return on investments. Um, so if I'm going to put in a million dollars in your business, I'm going to expect you know, 10, $100 million in return. And the size of the market opportunity has to justify that. Uh, and that's important even if you look beyond the for-profit world. If I'm going to in invest a million dollars in a nonprofit, the size of that impact better be there. Are you going to solve world hunger? Are you going to are you going to are you going to save 10 million people from malaria? You know what is the size of that? And it has to be substantial. And that's one of the ways you can stand out, as as we talked about earlier. The size of the market opportunity often speaks to the ambition of the entrepreneur. So you know if I if I pitch to you invest in my lemonade stand. You might wonder, well, you know, how big is this actually going to be? But if I pitch to you this unique formula, this lemonade stand that's going to scale worldwide, just like Starbucks, um, that's going to change your perspective. But that's going to require me to pitch my lemonade stand in a very different way, putting it in the context of a much larger, larger business opportunity. So be mindful of the, the size of the market that you're going after and positioning yourself in. And, and further to that, I would say it's okay if you're not going for the complete capacity right at the beginning. It's okay to have a, a, a plan to scale up. Acknowledging, acknowledging what you can and can't do is seen very favorably by judges, showing that you're realistic. But to Mike's point, having ambition 
that shows that you can be trusted with a vision to, to make it through the, the ups and downs. Um, but it's certainly, so having the long view um, is key and it certainly doesn't help to, it doesn't hurt, I mean, to acknowledge that the long view might not be the destination that you get to right at the beginning. So show, show agility on, on your subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, right people, right time. Uh, to that point about um, what you can do with what you have, your people are, are who really honestly, who investors uh, and judges will be trusting. So your idea might be awesome, but if you're not the right person to shepherd that idea through, it's still not gonna happen. In fact, I would go as far as to say, you might not even have the best of ideas, but if you've got the right people, you might be, you're, you might be worth investing in to arrive at the, the best idea. And so uh, demonstrating your authority, and by authority, I mean your expertise, uh, don't be afraid to share your life experiences. If it's uh, something that's driven you personally um, to come up with uh, an idea, tell the story of why you per what your personal experience was and why it's so important to you to be committed to this. That shows that you're the right person. But then tie it into why now is the right time. Mike, what was your experience with Lumen5? Yeah, so timing is really important in in any business that you pitch. Um, you know, the technology has to be ready, the landscape, the market, the opportunity, everything has to be there. So, right people, right time are two axes that uh, really make for that uh, success criteria. So, for example, in starting Lumen Five, and Lumen Five is a is a cloud based video creation platform. Had we started that company ten years ago, when people weren't watching videos on their mobile devices, uh, on the trains, and 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 such, it just there wouldn't be a purpose to it. And if we started a video creation company twenty years later, when the world has moved on to VR and AR and other more immersive spaces, it also wouldn't be the right time. Uh, and so timing is what are the trends happening in the world that makes this uniquely the right time to build this business? For example, let's say you want to pitch to me um, a new type of mask, right? Well, if you, if you pitch the right type of mask to me two years ago before COVID, not the right time. If you pitch it after the vaccine has circulated the world, also not the right time. So timing is really important. And the right people, um, that can be challenging, uh, especially when it comes down to, you know, if Elon Musk wants to start SpaceX, great. It's easy to say right people um, because of that strong track record. Uh, a lot of early stage entrepreneurs view themselves as lacking the the track record or the experience, but I don't think the right people is necessarily um, experience. So Mark Zuckerberg, a great example, you know, not a lot of experience prior to building Facebook. It does come down to the, the passion or even some sort of life experience. So let's say you grew up working in uh, helping out your parents in their construction business. That makes you the right team to solve a construction problem. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have built a construction business for you to be the right people. So it can often be very powerful to tie your business back down to your experience. Why are why do you think you're the right person to solve this problem? What unique insights do you have? What unique life experiences do you have that guides you to solve problems in a particular industry? Um, I just want to take a quick diversion. Amar, I see you have a question. And I'm wondering, um, I, the intention was that we would whip through just because of our time constraints. Are you okay with But if it's something that's really super relevant? No, um, I can wait till the end is fine. Okay, make sure you write it down because I don't want to miss it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, evidence, traction, track record. Yeah, I think, I think that's what, what you've been speaking to, Mike. And um, it's, it's all, it all plays into your story. Yeah, one thing I wanna, um, I wanna highlight, you know, traction and track record can be very powerful if you've been running a business for a couple of years and you have customers and you're, you're pitching your next round of funding. In the early stages, it can be hard to wrap your head around what evidence and traction looks like. Um, and really all it is, traction could be conversations. It could, it could simply be, hey, here's my business idea. I've spoken with these three experts in the field and here's what they think. Um, a lot of times if you're unable to build authority because you don't have a lot of experience or you don't, you're, you're not able to build that authority yourself, it is helpful to lend, uh, 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 to borrow the authority of others. So for example, let's say, you know, you want to, you want to start a 
a painting company and you have this unique formula and that's how you're going to win in the market. Instead of just saying that, go talk to someone in the paint industry, maybe a VP of some big paint company, um, get their thoughts and get their testimonial. Their testimonial can sometimes help you build traction. Better yet, um, getting a potential customer to sign some form of a letter of intent. You know, you could very easily whip up a letter that says, if I were to deliver on this service for this price, would you be uh, willing to be a customer? And it's, it's fairly low commitment, but they could be like, yeah, if you have this for me, I'll sign it. That is a form of traction too. Traction doesn't necessarily have to be money in the bank or actual customers. And if you're a nonprofit organization, that would look like an MOU. So bear in mind, not, none of those documents are legally binding. They could walk away tomorrow and there is no obligation, but it's as close to intention as you can get without an actual contract. And, it's, and it has value in these kinds of conversations. Oh, wasn't doing that, intending to do that, bear with me. You can click on that little square icon, two buttons left of exit. That's third to the right. Yeah, can the, you? The, the full screen icon is third to the right. Uh, on the very right exit, Got your it. icon, <laughs> there you go. I think it disappeared, so maybe it I can. It disappeared, yep, it totally disappeared. There we go. I don't um, think we see it. You might have to share screen again. At least I don't see oh, it. Oh, okay. You can't. Okay. So bear with me. We're back. Okay. Back on track. Sorry about that. Um, what to avoid, also very important. Too much information. You know your company so well, you know your inspiration so well, you know your market so well, you know what you can accomplish so well. Don't get bogged down by so well. Bear in mind, Anyone who you're hoping to influence knows nothing. So you have to understand the, their fluency in your subject matter. And even if they are uh, deeply embedded in the sector, it's still a case of what you need to share that's going to influence their behavior. And typically less is more. It's so easy to be excited and thrilled and then want to demonstrate your knowledge. Just remember decisions are made with simple information. Typically, humans consume nuggets of information best when they're delivered in threes. And so if you can provide three key reasons why your company is valid, three key reasons why you are to be trusted and why you're the right team, three key reasons what you're going to, why you're, you're in the best position to change what it is you hope to change, and then three key reasons why they should um, believe you. Uh, you don't have to, that's, that's not a prescribed formula, but that's just something you might wanna run through. It's so, I, I just wanna emphasize here, it's really easy to get sucked into giving too much information. Have you ever experienced that, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Amar act and Chad actually has a question that's relevant exactly to this point here. Um, uh, so the, the question is, storytelling is obviously great, but how do you do it given a limited am amount of time? A good analogy I always think to is movies and trailers. You know, a movie can be three hours long. A trailer is one to two minutes. They both tell a story, but they serve different purposes and different roles. Um, the purpose of a pitch, uh, especially in the context of an investment, is not to close the round of investment. It's to garner sufficient attention so that they want to meet with you and have a larger discovery process. Uh, so when thinking about a pitch, think of it as a, as a trailer. Um, if you go and watch through the Avengers trailer or you know, whatever movie you love, what are the highlights and how do you summarize the plot points just enough to hook and tease an audience to find out more? Um, and so you know, if you have too much information in the trailer, it, it might as well be a, 
be a movie. And it, it's all about how do you um, how do you highlight the most high impact components of your story in rapid succession within a short period of time. And we'll have some practice time afterwards to go through this um, as examples. Hey, listen, Mike, can I ask you, I, I realize uh, what's happening here is Zoom and uh, Google are not uh, interfacing. Uh, they're not playing nice in the same sandbox. I find that when I try to go on to Zoom features, yeah, no I lose my Google features. So would you mind oh. facilitating any chats or just flagging anything when, when yeah, I- Yeah, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep an eye on chat. Mostly we'll go through questions at the end, but if, if it happens to be relevant, I can weave it into the conversation. But yeah, you can Thanks continue. So I'll keep an eye. Sure, okay, great. So we're, uh, we're about halfway through now. So um, we're gonna talk about the recipes for success. And this is, this is getting in now to your storytelling. So again, have we told you, it's really important. You understand your customer. <laughs> you really need to understand who your audience is. Your judges will be wanting to know that you understand who your market is. They wanna know that you've got an unsolved or unaddressed problem that you are the right person to fix. And the painkiller or victim situation. This is, this is a fun one because it's uh, a vitamin, sorry. Is it, is what, this is where you really assess what is the problem. Is it something that is a, should be solved, must be solved? Is it compelling, has to be solved? Is it something that will make my life better if you solve it? And, and that's the difference between the painkiller and the vitamin. It's it, if it's a nice to have, that's fine. It doesn't have to be a pain that you make go away. But if it's a vitamin, then I need a whole lot more reason why, th why this, um, why I would take the extra effort to enrich my life and how you're going to en enrich it. Um, that's all really high level stuff. But I think Mike, you had some really, really um, succinct yeah. thoughts on this. As Lynn mentioned, understanding the customer is key, not just in the pitch context, but also in running your business. Uh, so keep in mind that the, the entire existence of a business is to serve a customer. So if you don't understand the customer, the reason for existence for the business kind of falls apart. The other thing to also keep in mind is the judges are not going to understand your customer. So you have a job to do to not only understand your customer, but to demonstrate that you understand the customer and then help the judges understand your customer. Um, oftentimes I find that there's two approaches to this. One is you simply tell the judge uh, how the customer behaves. The other is to really go deep into what kind of research you did. So going to the earlier example, you know, if I tell you customers like lemonade, that is a, it hits difference than if I said, I've spoken with a thousand customers and ran a survey and 87% of them say that they would pay $3 for a lemonade um, during summertime. So that, that's, that's the way in which you can build authority. Understanding the customer is also segmentation as well. So who is the customer that you're talking about? How well-defined are they? What are their characteristics? Um, you know, depending on your business, the customer is going to be very different. I would be sure to spend time in that in, in the customer component to make sure you can articulate who they are because that's uh, the, the first piece of the domino. Nothing else really falls into place unless you not understand the customer and can demonstrate that you understand the customer. The second piece here, unsolved or unaddressed, really goes down to the fact that if you pitch me a solved solution, I'm not interested. So for example, let's say you, you wanna say, um, dating is difficult, I wanna build a dating app. My first response is there's all these dating apps already. It seems like a solved problem. What are you doing that's unsolved? And from there, that's where the unique value proposition come in. You could say, well, the problem with existing dating apps is blah, 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 blah. And then you end up with new apps like Bumble, which uh, solves the problem that the previous generation of dating apps have come across. So making sure that you don't fall into the trap of judges feeling like it's already a solved problem. Um, and if it's already a solved problem, it's probably not a business worth building unless there's a, a very specific angle to it that you're taking. And then on the painkiller and vitamin point, I think those are the two, if you were to break down the, the world of problems, they usually come down to painkiller, which is I'm currently suffering from something and you're gonna help me alleviate that pain. 
vitamin is I'm not necessarily suffering from something, but it's preventative medicine. It somehow helps make my life better. And I, I like these two examples because they're both very large and successful industries. And those are two very different ways of building a business. So it's important for you to um, for you yourself to understand which of these two categories does your business fall into? Is it a need or is it a nice to have? And then positioning your whole story around that. If it's a painkiller, make sure you tell the customer pain points. Really help the judge build empathy around how difficult it is. So for example, let's say you're building an app that helps the blind navigate the world. Well, the way in which you tell that customer story is through how painful it is to navigate the world blind and how how meaningful a solution to solving that could be. Now, a vitamin could be that, um, you know, you, I, I currently wake up tired, but coffee can help you wake up super energized. And, and you might tell the story from a positive angle. Here's all the great things that could happen if you woke up with energy and you can go into everything you do with focus. Um, so those are two different ways of positioning the kinds of problems you're solving. So... When you're making a promising solution, what is it you're really trying to affect? What change are you affecting? You want to make a big impact. So regardless of whether you've got a nice to have vitamin that really does make life better or a painkiller that really makes a problem go away, it's got to have a big impact. It's got to be worth it. Then again, you're going back to your understanding your customer. What are all the steps that lead them to the conclusion that they're, that they're purchasing? What is it that they've gone through? You've asked them to go to the store. You've asked them to pick up something off a shelf, go to the counter, and then drive back home, do whatever it is they do to make this thing happen. Why is all that worth their while? So really be articulate, really drill down, be super, super succinct. And no matter how much you think you've summarized the way your, <clears throat> your problem um, is being solved with what you have to offer, do it again. Because you probably haven't been succinct enough to, under, to, to, um, to articulate why this is the single best solution of all the options that are out there. Mike, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, impact is, is, um, is one of the most common pitfalls, as we briefly discussed earlier. Early stage founders tend to undersell themselves, undersell the vision because they're trying to be realistic. Um, but uh, take, for example, SpaceX. You know, I can position to you, hey, invest in my space company. We're going to send rovers. We're going to take some photos. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to look great. And, 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 and I'm sure we're all curious about what's on Mars. I mean, that doesn't sound like big impact. Now, if I position to you as the Earth has a finite lifespan with global warming and all that's happening and the chances of meteoroids hitting the planet, we have to become a multi-planetary species for the survival of mankind. We have to colonize other planets as soon as possible. Otherwise, our race will go extinct. That is a big impact. Uh, and it's the same business doing the same thing, but the way in which you position the impact does matter as to whether or not people want to invest in you and listen to you. And be aware, there will be people who don't, who disagree. They will say, uh-uh, no, you make more problems by, mm -hmm. by leaving the planet. We got, a, we got a lot of work to do here. Just accept that they're not going to be your champions. And, and that's okay. So differentiation, that's where you've done, you've already done the landscape analysis. You've already explained what it is that's on the market already and who's doing it. You've shown your agility. You've shown that you're uh, an expert in the subject because not only do you know what you do, you understand who else is in the same space as you and how they're doing it. And so this is your opportunity to say why your way of doing it is the best way of doing it. It's, it's a really good idea to take the knowledge that you have about your customer and demonstrate that you understand how that customer is moving in other spaces, what they're doing and how the system currently is. And why are you shaking things up? Or why are you not shaking things up? Why are you only tweaking things slightly? Actually, maybe everything is going really, really well in this particular space, but you've noticed there's a really big important piece that's missing. And that's what you come in with a solution of. There's nothing wrong with elegant solutions. There's nothing wrong with something small. You don't have to be big and splashy. You just have to be sure that what you have is the right solution. 
There's also nothing wrong with big and splashy. Still have to be really sure that your big splashy solution is different from whatever else is already available. Yeah, Mike, what about that? Absolutely. Um, differentiation is a continuation of, of the, 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 the positioning that we've been talking about. So, you know, defining a problem and making sure it's unsolved is first and foremost, you have to convince me that there's an unsolved problem in the world. And differentiation really is how is your solution going to uniquely solve the problem in ways where others have failed. Uh, continuing on the dating app analogy, you know, the, the first level argument is there's a problem in dating. Great but there's already Tinder. So what's the problem? Then the problem, the unsolved problem goes, oh, well, women are receiving too many messages from men to a point that it's impossible to actually communicate or form meaningful relationships on Tinder. Okay, I understand that there's an unsolved problem in the space where there's a lot of activity. And then you could present an app like Bumble where you can say, well, our unique solution is such that only women on the platform can, um, can send messages to men. Okay, now I understand that you have a differentiated solution that solves an unsolved problem. And that's the way in which you wanna construct that argument so that I have to first buy into that there is a problem and then I have to buy into your unique solution to that problem. And that's what differentiation is. Do you wanna take over with timing? Keep going with yeah. timing? So timing is similar to what we talked about earlier um, in terms of uh, why now? Asking that question, answering that question preemptively to judges are really important. Uh, a lot of investment, everything is about timing. You know, if you put money in Bitcoin at the right time or GameStop at the right time, you're going to make a lot of money. So through the through the lens of an investor, they want to know why now. Um, and 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 chances are there is a good reason why you decided to start this business now. You just need to think about what are the trends happening in the world that's making this possible. Going to my personal example, building Lumen Five. The timing is such that there's more mobile phones than ever before. Mobile data is cheaper than ever before. And that has enabled people to watch videos on their mobile devices, no matter where they are in the world. And that created a lot of supply or that created a lot of demand for video contents. But supply is the problem. Who's going to make all these videos? And that's the problem that we solve through video creation. So that's how I position timing in the context of why building Lumen5 five years ago doesn't make sense. Five years later doesn't make sense. And now is the perfect time for me to be building what I'm doing. So think about your business in the context of timing. And also think about the timing going forward as well. What do you anticipate the space to look like? What evolution do you see your industry going? And why will you still be the right solution at the right time in two years, three years, five years, seven, nine, ten years time? It's not... Um, it's, it's, a, it's not a static situation. Timing is something that is right, right for right now. It's also where your expertise and your authority to be the expert in this space comes in because you understand it. You're agile and you understand how it's evolving. And so speak to the timing of the future. Pro tip, if your pitch does not mention COVID or the pandemic in some way, you're doing something wrong. There's, there's some really critical issues that are inescapable. Everyone is touched by the pandemic. It is a nice, easy tool that everyone can connect on. So why would you, why, why, how, think about how the, you can use the pandemic as in, in your pitch as part of what your solution is. Don't get me wrong. If it's really not relevant, don't weave it in. Don't put it in there. It's, it's going to be candy or window dressing. But honestly, in, in, in times like these, it's just a no-brainer to acknowledge the situation that, that we're in and what, what are the steps forward. So the right team. Diversity of exper expertise. You may be the, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because we have Raj Chatterjee of um, moment to speak to us. And Raj has a, a lot of experience in diversity of expertise because he's worked with a number of interdisciplinary teams. And so he's going to be able to um, uh, do a presentation, uh, a trial draft run presentation. Um, and I'd like to let him speak to that. What I would say is diversity of expertise can look like any number of things. But being a specialist in something is great. Being a specialist in something is also a problem. You've got to be good at what you, you've become good at what you do. So where are your weaknesses? 
that's where your team comes in. So I'm a marketing expert, but I have, as you probably noticed, I'm not super strong in technology. That's okay. I've got Mike here to coach me on how to manage through. <laughs> and so you've got to look at honestly at what your weaknesses are, understand what um, plugs need to, what holes need to be plugged in order to make yourself bulletproof. Um, yeah. Mike? Yeah, at a university level, one very common thing is, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you'll fail for sure, but, you know, more often than not, when three business students get together to start a tech company, that's like a great example where, yeah, business students tend to have lots of ideas on how they can solve problems. And you might nail all of the other parts that we talked about before. You understand the customer, you understand the problem, you're good at building the business case. Um, but the natural question on the, on the behalf of an investor or a judge is, Great. I get that you really understand the business we're trying to build, but who's going to build this thing? You're pitching me a technology platform, but you don't have a chief technology officer. Who is that person? Uh, and more often than I'm than I've than not, I find that if the pitch is we're going to go hire a tech person, that's not good enough for a judge. Um, and so something to keep in mind is what kind of diversity of experience is there on your team? For me personally, uh, my, the two of my co-founders that I work with is I come from a product and design background and they come from uh, deep tech and development and programming backgrounds. So when we position our business, we don't claim to be the best in sales and marketing. The, the promise that we deliver is I'm good at product design, I'm good at solving customer problems, and my co-founders are really good at building them. Um, and so just, just knowing what your strengths are and positioning your business relative to that is really important. Exactly. I, uh, I'll quickly answer a question from Amar um, because we're on the topic of diversity of expertise. You know, in, in, a, in a team of one, that is obviously very challenging. Um, I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to include this in the pitch, but at, at the very least be prepared in the Q&A section. Someone will ask you as a founder of one, do you plan on finding additional co-founders? Um, so I don't know what your plan is, Amar, or if uh, any other teams of ones are out there. It is totally valid to say, yes, I'm currently a team of one, but I'm in the process of acquiring a technical co-founder or a business co-founder. Um, I think it is, it is important to communicate whether you plan on seeking a co-founder versus you just plan on outsourcing the technology of your platform. Um, so if you do plan on finding partners, I think it's valid. Uh, just make sure you communicate that. And, and, and I also think it's really important uh, as, as a general rule of thumb to acknowledge your weaknesses because that shows that you're honest, that you can deal with challenges that your company has honestly and you don't wear, wear rose-colored lenses. And so if you acknowledge that, yep, this is a situation that I have, um, I haven't got a solution for it now and I'm not going to get a solution for it quickly because I really want to take my time. I really want to see how the company is evolving. I really want to see where our weaknesses are. I really want to understand the market better. Any number of reasons why you um, aren't going to solve the problem instantaneously, but you are going to solve the problem. Again, that just shows your authority. That shows your understanding. And frankly, it shows your maturity. And so it's, that's a, maturity is a, is a very valid factor in deciding whether or not to invest in you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Sorry? Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Energy, passion, and commitment. There, you can't have too much of this stuff. You really, you really do have to live, breathe. You have to be the annoying person at the party who can't stop talking about what it is you're doing because you believe in it so much. And, uh, you know, Careful with that. Uh, don't don't get thrown out of the party because you're so annoying. But energy, passion, and commitment are really going to drive you in the dark dog days. It's it's a reality. It will there are times will get tough. And so if you understand that what you're doing has a trajectory, it's part of a, a long term process, and that there are challenges that you don't even see coming up, but you are prepared to take on you will, um, you know, we keep talking about authority, but you will get, you, you, you will demonstrate why you're the right person. What do you think, Mike? 
Yeah. So um, you know, any judge, any investor, uh, any mentor has worked with and seen enough young entrepreneurs in their career and seen that 90% of them will, will fail simply because they give up and simply because they've had enough. Uh, and having done this for 10 years, I can tell you that, yeah, it's, it's you know, 80% grunt work and, and really grinding through uh, midnight oils. And then there's the 20% of wins. So you have to have a lot of energy and passion to carry you through to do this type of work for decades. And it's, it's just everyone in the community acknowledges that it's extremely challenging work. Um, and this doesn't get written down in criteria or rubric or competitions. Investors don't often mention it as an explicit criteria. It's almost implicit. If you don't come across as having the energy and commitment to preserve year, it, none of the other stuff actually matters. Even if you have a sound business plan, you have expertise, if you can't convince me that you care enough about this to make sacrifices and to sustain that commitment across many, many, many years, um, you're simply not the right choice for my investment. If I'm going to put in a million dollars in your business, I would rather put in put in someone who's less experienced, maybe with a less fleshed out business plan, but because I know their passion is going to help them navigate those challenges in the years to come. I would still invest in that person. Um, and that's the, the kind of some of the unspoken criteria when it comes to pitching and investment and entrepreneurship that's very important to take note of. And I, I want to clarify too, energy passion doesn't have to come across as, as extroversion. And I think that's one thing that a lot of introverted, introverted entrepreneurs struggle with is, oh, I'm not this bombastic, outspoken person. I'm going to go in and throw confetti in the air. That's not really uh, what passion is. Passion can be expressed through the time and energy you've spent already in looking into a space in, in just being authentic and explaining why you want to work on this in the first place. And you can be very monotone and still come across as passionate with conviction. So it's not just a center of the party kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, and listen, I know we're getting some um, great questions in the chat. Again, I am mindful of the time. I think we're over already. So if you can park those questions, keep them. Um, I also want to manage expectations. We're going to do our very best to get to them, but you, we're accessible. Mike and I are also available offline after this seminar ends. If um, it, We'll stick around as long as we can to address them. But if you find that you don't have your questions, please do feel free to send them to us. Um, deep insights, Mike. Yeah, so the right team knows something about the industry that nobody does. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, before, let, let's continue with the dating app example because I think uh, a lot of people generally understand the concept. Um, deep insight is seeing that dating, the problem in dating is not just men connecting with women. It is in the, in the offset ratio of men to women on apps like Tinder. And so a deep insight is to recognize that, um, that specific problem of the messaging ratio of women receiving too many messages from men. And through that deep insight, that's how you can give birth to an idea like Bumble, which is just a very slight tweak of the Tinder idea. And uh, I believe the last time I checked, they're going public. So a very, very big success success story and a great example of a, a deep insight into an existing problem, minor tweak that led to massive success. So deep insight is, you know, not just pitching the lemonade stand, but having the deep insight to understand that, oh, well, we recognize that this is really the demographic who drinks lemonade. It is I don't know, children under 12, then the real problem is they actually can't afford the market rates of lemonade, but they also care less about the quality of lemonade. And as a result, we're going to sell this 30 cent lemonade targeted at um, children six and under. Like that's the kind of deep insight that you need to demonstrate. Surface level business problems are not very compelling. Um, and depending on your business, there's probably a surface level version of the problem. And then there's a deep version of the problem. And what you want to get to and demonstrate within a short period of time is you have that deep insight. Um, the judge should walk away feeling like, oh, I didn't know that that problem existed. But now that I do, I'm fully convinced that it needs to be solved. And that's the kind of thing that you want to go into. It's actually much harder to, you know, if, if, if your pitch is I'm going to so solve world hunger. It's too generic. Everyone knows we need to solve world hunger. What do you know about world hunger that I, as a judge, don't? That's what you want to get to. Yeah, those are those are called wicked problems, and they can't sing. They can't be solved by a single solution. Going back to the lemonade stand, you might have done enough research and found out something that none of your competitors did, which is that lemonade stands that are typically set up in the shade 
are more successful than ones set up in sunny spots. Why? Because people buy lemonade to cool down and shade really helps them do that. So that's an elegant solution, right? Like that's a teeny tiny little tweak that can make all the difference. So understanding your, your risk. Competitive landscape, we've talked about uh, differentiation. Competitive landscape is laying it all out. What's happening? What does the landscape look like for your market? You get the approval, you get the funding, you get the support you need, you're gonna go, where, where are you gonna land? Where are you going to? What does the competitive landscape look like? Who is doing what? How are they doing it? Why are they successful? And how are you going to be different? That's your differentiation. Why is your solution going to be better in this landscape? Mike? Yeah, this is, a, this is also a very common pitfall for early stage entrepreneurs is it, um, I see a lot of pitches where they don't mention competition. It is scary because competition almost feels like a negative thing. So you don't want to talk about it because it makes it sound like you're not going to be successful. Um, but most judges, mentors, and investors will know that every market, every good market has competition. Um, if you have no competition at all, it, it's probably a signal that there's nothing there. There's no opportunity, which is why nobody has tried to solve the problem. Um, I would I would be very cautious of of. Uh, of even for your own business, if you truly believe there's no competition, there might be something wrong and it might be worth yeah. revisiting. And I, I, would I don't trust anyone who thinks there's no competition. <laughs> and I would expand um, the, the scope or the definition of comp competition to just alternatives. Uh, you know, how is the problem currently being solved? It doesn't necessarily need to be a direct competitor. Um, you know, are they doing it in another way? So, uh, you know, for example, let's say this was before paint existed. Uh, you can say that there's no direct competition to a software like Microsoft paints, but you can say that, oh, how are people currently addressing that? Well, they're using an actual brush on paper. Um, and that is an alternative that people are using to paints. And what we're bringing is a digital version of paint. So that's an example of viewing the competitive landscape through the lens of alternatives, as opposed to actual direct competitors. So when you're you're looking at the competitive landscape, you've got some fabulous statistics. It shows it turns out that 79.7% .7 of all lemonade stands are positioned in sunshine. You've got an awesome opportunity because you know that people linger longer and spend more money in the shade. External constraints. There are many things you don't have control over. And again, honesty is the best policy. Acknowledge, you don't have control over what the weather is going to do this summer. So what are the factors that are outside of your control? List them all off. You should have a plan for an approach that um, looks something like a plan B. But if you at least acknowledge that there are factors and here's what we think we know, you're on the right track you're showing you're showing your vulnerability in this and showing your vulnerability means that you are um alert to the changing landscape mike yeah so um risk is all about viewing it through the investor landscape so if i were to ask you to invest in my business and give me you know half of everything you own well, the, the first thing you're going to be mindful is what am I investing in? And then the second part is how might this investment fail? And that's what understanding risk is all about. The first piece that we talked about, ex competitor is a very common way in which a business fails. And then also external constraints. These are things outside of your control, as Lynn mentioned. Uh, so for example, um, let's say you're building a, a business in real estate and you're saying, hey, Vancouver real estate market is going really well. And my business model is to flip houses. Well, an external constraints could be, what if the housing market crashes? How is your business, uh, is it going to survive? How is it going to adapt through these external circumstances and market forces that will impact your business? Um, and being able to communicate that puts the investor at ease to know, okay, maybe the answer isn't necessarily clear, but I know the founder is aware and that goes a long way as opposed to me feeling like you're going to be blindsided by external constraints. Exactly. If you come to me and say part of the money I want from you is because I know that there are factors that I can't foresee, but we know that we've got a long term plan, then you're telling me that you're you're going to put some rainy day money aside from you. I'm already looking at you as somebody who's reliable and thinking ahead. And the stakeholder composition. 
Mike, why don't you start off with this? Yeah. So every business touches on a lot of different people. And, and I think um, uh, there was a question about this. This is slightly relevant um, from Ali. Ali yeah. Um, so, you know, there's supply chains too, or actually this was an earlier question, I think from, um, there's so many questions. We'll go through it later. Somebody asked about supply chain, about suppliers. Every business touches on many different stakeholders and, and it goes all the way from the founder to the employee, to the partners that you have, to the investors, to the suppliers, to the customers, your customers, customers. So um, that's one thing that's really important to understand. To get to put into context in our own, um, uh, my own business, Lumen5, we're a video creator. We sell our video creator to businesses but really the stakeholder is the businesses are not creating videos for themselves. They're creating video for their customers. So our full stakeholder landscape is us as the product builder, or the businesses as the customer, and then the, the videos that they create for their customers. And we have to take into consideration all of those stakeholders. Uh, what kind of creation experience are businesses looking for? And then what kinds of videos are the, our customers, customers looking for? Um, stakeholder composition is just demonstrating that you understand all the people in your business ecosystem. If you're a, a, an e-commerce platform and you're building a physical product, then naturally your stakeholders are going to include your manufacturer. So being able to mention that, yes, this product's business is going to depend on the success of our manufacturing partnerships, being able to communicate your strategy around how you're going to address those manufacturing challenges will go a long way to assessing the risk. So, and that's a really great example because Mike's company is a B2B company. If Mike didn't understand that the, the, the B2, understand the B2C component, he'd be missing something really big and really, really important. So understanding who the end user will be and why, why your customer is providing, is, is um, eliminating a pain point for their customer is really, really part, uh, an important part of your story. Um, forgive me, for those of you who've been to sessions with me before, you've heard this story, but it's honestly the best one I know. A friend of mine sells very high-end medical equipment. Um, her users are surgeons. And because her equipment is so high-end, it's technologically cutting edge and surgeons love that stuff. That's fantastic. They want um, to, to buy her products, but guess what? The actual purchasers is the purchasing departments in hospitals. And so no matter how fabulous or wowy her equipment is, it's got to make good business sense for the purchasers. So she really has to understand her stakeholders, who her stakeholders are and who the decision makers are, who holds the levers and what are those levers doing? Okay, I wanna to quickly touch on here. Um, you can probably reveal some of the texts, Lynn, so we have sure. some context. Um, so I, I do wanna state, I know we're running close to the hour. Financials, as far as Lynn and I's review of the criteria of enterprise isn't really a piece that you have to think about, um, but we felt that it wouldn't do, do the presentation justice if we don't talk about financials. Uh, obviously a very big point if you're gonna be pitching investors. Um, Here's a very, very basic financial model that I just laid out and how I would go approach it is everyone knows that financial forecasts in the early stages are highly unlikely to be accurate. They just want to know that there's some thinking, that there's some methodology around it. Uh, and how I would forecast it, uh, really it's forecasting profitability through revenue and expenses. You've got here this graph that I've, a very simple graph, just showing um, the profit at the end of that month. And in January, I'm losing $5,000. February, I'm losing 4,000, 3,200, uh, 2,000, 1,000. And I'm forecasting uh, that I will break even in June and then start to profit on a monthly basis. So this is an example of a very basic financial model. In this financial model, what I would fundraise is the bottom half of that graph. By losing uh, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, it's a total of $15,000. That's how much deficit I plan to operate in. So the pitch is, I would like to raise $15,000 from you with the expectation that we're going to break even in June and then grow the business from there. Now, obviously, this is extremely simplistic. There's lots of different um, potential trajectories you could map it. Uh, the last point I want to touch on here is to be sure to break down your financial forecast by number of customers and number of deals. So instead of just saying, we're going to make 
$5,000 is that from five customers paying you $1,000 each have some sort of expectations of sales of deals. Um, and really it's just putting in your best guesses into spreadsheets. Uh, and again, having something is better than nothing, but there's very little expectation that you're actually going to follow that trajectory in the early stages. Exactly. Um, why don't we, so we'll flip, why don't we flip over to the next slide, which is the template, but before splitting off into workshops, uh, we can, uh, we can answer some questions. How does that sound? Sounds great. We are going to leave you before we, as, as Mike says, we've got a template. So when we leave you, we'll leave you with a tool. Um, we've given you a ton of information. We hope you've been able to take notes or that you'll come back and get the recordings from, from this. But we are going to give you a tool in a moment that you can actually use to draft up your pitches. Um, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of different questions and I'll go through them. Um, we'll go through them as quickly as possible, I guess. Uh, in terms of, you know, balancing the telling of a story to the time constraints, I think the template will answer some of this question. Um, so, so we'll come back to that once we reveal the template here. Um, uh, with the uh, single path for company versus articulating multiple directions. So Glenn had a question earlier around, you know, as a business, you have three or four different directions that you could win the market. How do you, do you position these options? Uh, I would never position it as options to the investor. Uh, at the end of the day, it's your business. Your investors are not running your company, um, but do position them as future expansion potential. So let's say there's three different paths forward. Pick the one that you're most passionate in and set that as phase one and present your business um, with that strategy in mind, but mention that once we've completed this phase, here's two other ways in which we can um, we can expand the business. So making sure you articulate the different directions, but in the context of a chronological order to imply priority. So you know what you're going to work on next. The, the last thing you want is to say, here's four strategies and we're going to go, go after all of them at the same time. Uh, that communicates a lack of focus and likelihood for failure. Um, so, uh, Ali had a question around, you know, if a business knows that there's demand, but the supply takes time to come, is that enough? Uh, I, I think it's, it's very useful for you to communicate your knowledge of the state of affairs. Uh, again, you are the voice of authority. So if you say suppliers have a turnaround time of 45 days, great. As a judge, I have no reason to doubt you unless it's a very ridiculous number. So just presenting your understanding, presenting your constraint, and it goes back to understanding risk is you can, you, you can and should present the risk in a supplier relationship, you could say, in the case that a supplier doesn't doesn't deliver, we have two backup relationships at all time that we can fall back to. Um, a lot of that sometimes come up in Q and A as opposed to the core presentation. So be sure to be prepared for those questions. Um, how do you balance your time between talking about the problems you're trying to solve and the solution? So I think the template will cover some of that. Is it okay to overstate loss and understate profits? Um, this one's a difficult one. As I mentioned earlier, if you overstate or if you overpromise, oftentimes you shoot yourself in the foot when you actually develop the relationship. Uh, in this pitch presentation context, you know, you win the competition and, and that's about it. So that's an artificial environment. In a real environment, if you win the pitch and they invest money in you, that's a continuous working relationship that will pan out, which means that if you overstate your financials, you're going to have to explain to them why you weren't able to deliver the goals. Uh, and it's up to you and, and, and to, to determine. And you can communicate that, hey, what I'm demonstrating here is a conservative view of our financials. That is totally acceptable. Um, but do try not to overstate and overpromise because you will suffer for it. That relationship will suffer for it. And the investor will feel like you lied to them uh, into giving you their money. So um, again, you know, as long as you are authentic about it, that usually is good enough. It's acceptable for you to have made a mistake in the financial forecast, which is not the same as presenting over promises, even though you knew you weren't able to deliver. Um, and I would uh, be very, very careful about that differentiation. Uh, should we include the why now slide or integrate into the value proposition? You know, the why now is, is a quick sentence and you'll see in the template that, uh, uh, Lynn, how long is the presentation? Is it five minutes or shorter? Uh, five minutes. Yeah, it's five minutes. So we'll go through the template. Uh, with nonprofits, where's the focus on high demand and global value and not massive revenues? Um, uh, hopefully throughout the presentation, you got a sense that it's not always about the revenue. Give me the massive impact. You know, charity water is not revenue. 
revenue. It's, it's, it's giving people access to water, but millions of people around the world. So what is this big impact that I can have by investing in your nonprofit? Make sure you tease out the size of that. Uh, so I'll quickly go over, there's lots of different pitch templates. If you Google startup pitch template, you're gonna get lots of different frameworks. Um, the Kawasaki template is one of the, one of the classic ones. Uh, and really it's just 10 slides. It's the title, tell me about the problem. Really it's one sentence in the context of a five minute presentation. So what is the problem? You can say the problem is in dating. Uh, and the opportunity is that as big of an app like Tinder is, there's a big gender ratio problem and women are having a very bad time on the Tinder app. The value proposition that we bring is we're gonna make it so that women are the ones who proactively send the messages um, and that's gonna solve a bulk of the problem that's currently happening on Tinder. Um, the underlying magic, I don't actually know Bumble's underlying magic. I think their founder uh, had, had some specific experience. The underlying magic is your, uh, why you're the right team. And that could be, well, the founders of Bumble have been in the dating space working on Plenty of Fish for some time. And that's why we know the space very well. The business model is very simple. We're going to charge men for super likes to get attention uh, of women on the platform. And our go-to-market plan is to go specifically after um, female users. And here's how we're going to do it through these platforms. And through our competitor analysis, we find that most of uh, Tinder's users are men. And so, you know, where we're going to succeed is by building a dating app for women. And if we're able to be successful by building a dating app for women, then the men will come. And then you talk about your management team, about uh, specifically what, who, who are on your team and who are you going to hire to compensate for your weaknesses. You'll go through some financial projections and say it's going to cost us, you know, let's say a million dollars to build this app. We plan to acquire a million users one year from now and we're going to break even on year two and then show a bit of um, uh, brief directions. And then the current status. We've currently built a minimum viable product. We have a thousand beta users. They're having a good time. We've facilitated 18 matches. Um, so, you know, I, I covered an entire Bumble pitch within five minutes. Uh, in terms of how you balance your time, you do want to touch on all these points, uh, but sim uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So really you want to communicate each of these major points in one or two sentences. Um, so you'll have to get really good at that. And a common uh, workflow that I like is write your pitch however it feels most natural. It's probably gonna be a 25 minute pitch for you to tell your full story. Then summarize, can you do 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, and really trimming the fats, reducing the use of words. And um, again, it's how do you take a Lord of the Rings movie, which is three hours, and how are you gonna produce the one minute trailer? Uh, so the, the first version of the pitch is probably going to be long, but that's where the preparation comes in. And that's what we're here for. So um, we have a couple of victims, I mean, uh, volunteers who are going to d give us their version of, of their pitches. Um, I think they've synthesized some of what they've heard here, but don't let me fool you. They are uh, very successful in their own rights and have had um, and have won a number of prizes. So um, the, the format for, for going forward will be, <clears throat> excuse me, the format going forward will be um, Raj and Barry will each be doing a pitch. Um, you'll be able to see what we're talking about. Um, and then we'll go into breakout rooms where you and, you and your teams will be able to create your own pitch. 